your name, your full name, your age, and your date of birth. Okay, I'm Maynard Lewison. I'm almost 91, and uh, my date of birth is uh, 1932. And your parents' names? My parents' name is Lenora M. Thompson, now Lewison, and my dad is Oris B. Lewison. And then your siblings' names? My brother is seven years younger than me, <coughs> Alan Lewison, and my sister is 14 years younger than me, Karen Davison. And uh, then I had three daughters, Tamara Faye Lewison, now Wilson, Candace Sue uh, Cress now, and uh, Darcy Lee, 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 Darcy, Ann Lee. Okay. And where <coughs> did you live growing up? I grew up here till I was 17. I was still in school. And then I uh, got drafted and I finished the school and let me stay home another six months before I went and then I went into service. So where did you start? Where did you go for basic training? In 52, I, I went to uh, the cities and I went by train to Lackland Air Force Base, in San Antonio. And then we was there for, tell them, I think it was six weeks. And from there I went to a tech school in, in uh, California. It was Camp Stoneman where I went. It was an army base. And then we, I got out of there and then I went to uh, uh, Kansas. Topeka first and then to Salina. And then I was there for about six months. And then I got my degree to go overseas. So what did you go to school for in California? I was in the motor pool, uh, automotive. And that's uh, how I got going later. So then how about in Kansas? What did you learn there? What did I do? Yeah, what did you learn there in Kansas? Well, that Did you have was, we were, no, we were just working on, we took care of all the power units to put on the airplanes when to plug them in so they'd have electricity and, and uh, the oxygen and we supplied them with oxygen and everything. And, uh, and that, that's about it for the, there, we, me and my, uh, my good buddy, that's who I met, Sam Lewis, at that time. And, and uh, him and I became very good friends. And today we still are good friends. So. So then um, you had mentioned to me the brig. Well, we never got in the brig, but uh, we went to a movie in Kansas one day and <clears throat> Somebody got up and the movie was just starting and there's one guy up in the balcony says, you keep acting up like that, Tarzan will get you. And that was the, the abbreviation of the movie yeah, the, where the big lion was. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and we got through out of the movie so we none of us used our right name. We had to sign who we were when we walked out. <laughs> so. <laughs> so then how did you get to Guam? What what did they decide to send you there for? <clears throat> they didn't tell us what it was. When we got there, they says, well, the other guys, they all went to the main base about halfway down on the island, and and uh, my name came up, and I had to go to the Anderson Air Force Base and take over what I was doing with all the generators and everything there. I'd never had no experience with it, but I, I learned Every day it was a learning process, so. Tell us about your trip to get there. 
When you did you get to come home on leave before you left for Guam? No. Well, just before I left for Guam, that's when I got my orders in Kansas. And from Kansas, I had that 39 Ford uh, car that I'd bought down there. It wasn't much, but it, so then I had to bring that home. And I, 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 so I used up one whole day clearing the base, and I got out of there about 5.36 at night, and then I... I stopped and bought some new no dose, and between coffee and no dose all the way home, why? And then it rained pretty all the way, and and uh, my old Ford that had vacuum windshield wipers, so every now and then I'd have to, about every oh maybe three times in a whole mile, let off in the foot feet so I get enough vacuum to run the wipers, and then back to the <laughs> wipers going, and and uh, we we got home and. And then all these guys, all my buddies here, Wootsie and all them guys, they wanted to, said, hey, be in your home. You better come with us tonight. We're going to the cities. <clears throat> oh, I says, I can't do that. I says, I've been up all night with no dose. And he, ah, oh, come on. So they finally talked me into it. So I went up there. I had two beers, and man, I could hardly stay awake anymore. We went to a dance, and I got out of the dance. And the girls all said, I was meeting all the girls that were from here, there, come, come on over and have breakfast. So then we left the dance early and went over to the, had breakfast. Boy, and I seen that couch there, and I went and laid down. I said, I'm going to take a little nap first. Man, they, they couldn't wake me up. I was gone. <laughs> I woke up in the morning and somebody was sitting on the bed on the Davenport beside me there, and that was Lois. She says, we thought you died. <laughs> <laughs> so then we got up and I had a little coffee and some couple eggs and toast and came home. And when we got home, I, I looked at her and I says, would you want to go up to Austin and have a Sunday or something the night at Dairy Queen? And she said, yeah. So that was the only date I had with her. And then the next morning we left at 4 and went to Des Moines and got on the city of San Francisco train. Mom took me down there and and uh, got on the train and I left. And then it was two and a half years before I got home again. So you rode the train to San Francisco. Yeah. So then what, what did you take from San Francisco on then? A uh, little canoe. <laughs> that was a boat. It wasn't very big, but we went and... and we, so tell us about that <coughs> boat. Well... And where you left? You left from San Francisco. Yeah. And it was so gorgeous. I look back at that Golden Gate Bridge, and I says, "Man, I'll probably never see that boat, that butt bridge again." But I did eventually, and uh, we went over, and we stopped in Hawaii, and uh, put on fuel, and we got off the boat for half a day, three, four hours, and back on, and we took off and got to Guam. Was that a smooth boat ride for you? Yeah, that it, that one wasn't bad, but coming home was terrible. So then, once you got there, what was your what was your schedule like when you got there? Well, we got off and went to the to our headquarters, and they said, "Well, John Bunger and you guys, you you're all going to the communication center." And they says, "Maynard, you're going to the air base." That was 12 miles farther north. So I went up there, and the guy that was there says, well, I'm leaving in the morning. And I got to talk to him a little bit, and that was it. That was my knowledge of what was going to happen. So I just had to learn from there. So, so I, what did you do? What did you run? I had two generators under the control tower, and uh, one generator down on base operations, and one on uh, the uh, <clears throat> the uh, radar to land planes and on and off the base all the time. And then I I had two more 
generators backed up too, so I had to have two generators running for the the rest of it all the time. Mm -hmm for all the runway and that. And so was there anyone there with you to help you do that? No, I was all alone. And after I was there for about two months, so I, these people said they were going back to the States and they, he was a, 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 a Air Force, gen, uh, not general, but a, a, a staff sergeant or something. And, he says, you wouldn't be interested in having a dog. You're out there all by yourself. I says, sure. So I took the dog, and, and she was with me for the, the whole stay there. Mm -hmm. And what was her name? Queenie. She was wonderful, most wonderful dog that you could ever ask for. She right beside me by my legs all the time. She never get in the way, but she was right beside me, and at night, if if the diesels weren't working right, I'd just lay on my workbench there in my bigger shed and listen to them run and take a nap, and she'd jump up and lay right between my feet, and then and she'd put her head on my knee and look right at me. So nobody's going to get close to me. When I served my 18 months there, I was coming home. I was all set to come home. I was walking out of the barracks, and I was just a little ways away from the barracks, and then I, I had probably another 500 feet to go to the plane. And here come two MPs, drove up in Jeeps, and they jumped out, and they says, just stop right there. So I stopped, and I thought, now what's going on? And uh, anyway, why, they said, just wait. And then my commander came in the chaplain, and my commander walked up to me and he says, you might want to sit down a minute, we've got a problem. And then I says, oh boy, I thought something happened to mom and dad. And they says, effective this morning now at eight o'clock, you've been extended one year. So I had to stay. I was a little hard to get along with for a little bit, boy. So then I, I had all the shots for her, had her in a, in a kennel that I made, you know, and, I, we were going home, you know. Well, and I had to have the shot six months in advance, so I thought, well, she got all the shots, so I didn't inquire the second time about it. And then we were about two months from going, and so I inquired about it. No, they said she's going to have to have all the shots again. You can take her, but when you get to California, they're going to euthanize her. Oh, I says, I can't do that to her. But... <laughs> Maybe it had been better if I would have, because <laughs> when, after I got home and got to my other base, why then they, they sent me a letter and said, since you've been gone, she'll drink water, but she will not eat. So I, boy, that printer did, did me in. While I was over there, I got the call home one time. And that's why I really like it for the military now. They can call home every day if they want. But uh, <clears throat> but I got to call home one time. And that was for three minutes, $73. And then the phone, you had to click it to talk, to click it back to listen. The operator come on every minute and says, you have two minutes left, you have one minute left, and bam, it was gone. So that was the end of it. And Dad, when he got on, then he broke down. He couldn't talk to me. So but I talked to Mom and talked to Lois. But I had to go through base operations to find out what time was going to be 6 o'clock here because we're about a day and a half behind over there. And then... We, uh, I wanted it for six years, so then I, I think it was about 2.30 in the morning or something like that, that I had to be at the phone thing there mm -hmm. and talk to them, you know, so. It was different, but it was, it was good. Mom and Dad knew I was still alive, you know, so. So but, tell us about your scooters or your motorcycles that you had. Yeah, I... I bought a Indian Triumph and I sent for home because it was laying in a pile. 
by one of the Guamanian houses there, so I seen it there one day, so I asked him what he wanted for it. Ah, he says, it's all junk. He says, they ain't got, they ain't got no parts here for them. He says, give me $5 if you want to try it. So I did. I sent home and told Dad roughly what I thought I needed. He got me the parts. I got it running. So then I ran that for, oh, maybe two, three weeks. But I had nine speeding tickets in less than a month. So I said, no more, no more of that. So I sold that then. I made a little money on it. So what was the speed limit? Speed limit over there was 30. Time you'd shift out of first gear into second while well, you had a ticket. <laughs> and uh, there was rocks on the on the roads that would fall down off the side of the mountains and places, and there was no blacktop at, at that time. But uh, about maybe six months later, why well, they got blacktop on one main street going down through there. So that was pretty nice. So didn't you borrow an officer's scooter at some time or a motorcycle or something? No, that was mine. Then I bought this motor scooter. Okay. And now I bought that in the junk pile too and I, I got parts from dad sent home and he sent me the parts. That was a Cushman motor scooter. That would do about 30 wide open, you know, so that was good. And that's what I used running back and forth from the barracks to the to my work and around and sometimes I'd just take the Jeep or the six by six, whatever was handy to, or for me to take, you know, and, and uh, run around and, <clears throat> and uh, so then I just, that was part of my work. I had to change oil pretty often because the power units, if they, when it was really hot, when it got up to be a hundred, then I had to change them every four hours drop them down and, and get two others on. And I'd have to tell them when I was going to do it, you know. I'd tell, uh, tell them in the uh, radar site, which was probably 500 feet away from me. So they were a little, oh, no, no, no. I just walked over there and talked to them. They couldn't walk over to me, but I could walk over to them. If they walked over, they'd have to holler. Just the final controller from the radar site could could talk to me. He could come in my shack. So tell us about your barracks there, your shack. Your oh, it was, it was just a regular condo. It was really nice. This here is my condo. Two and a half years <laughs> I was in this. Here's the cables going up to the control tower right above me. And then I... <clears throat> it was all like this, but we weren't getting enough ventilation, so I brought my torch in and cut it up here and across, and then we put hinges in so we could fl flip it up, get some fresh air in there, and then put some screens back there because the mosquitoes were bad over there. And uh, then at night, we just took that two by four and put up there, or if and when it was storming, Raining, and then we'd have to shut it down so that it didn't rain in on us. But nobody said anything to us. We just did as we pleased, you know. It was a, but it was a beautiful condo. It had all black top, just like the roads that you drive on. That was our floor in there. Floor. So and did you the, have running water? No, we had to go to the latrine for the running waters and that to shower and that. And, but uh, the hard part was that the water all tasted like, if you took a drink in the ocean, it just tasted the same way out of the water pipes. And so those guys all brushed our teeth. I used uh, Windsor or Canadian Club whiskey to wash my toothbrush off and, and uh, every day and then take a mouthful and slosh it around and spit it out, get the toothpaste out. Colgate toothpaste doesn't go good with, with, with Windsor, Windsor or something. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, some, but then uh, we still had another problem. We had a lot of red ants over there. And so I just, I could have, I had unlimited access to gasoline or diesel fuel or oil all I had to do was sign my name and they'd 
dump it off at my shop for me. So we brought diesel fuel in and poured in the cracks in the floors in the barracks. And, that, and then the ants couldn't get to us, but then we still had a few of them. So then we got coffee cans from the, from the kitchen, the chow hall, and we put our bed legs in, the, in that and then filled them with diesel fuel. So we had a half a skid of, but I'm still alive today. And, and we had mosquito nets down over us at night. We sprayed with that. I don't think that spray was probably something that could burn or kill us too, but we got along with it. The Japanese were about 500 feet away from me. And- uh, <clears throat> Hiding. Yeah, they were in the jungle. You couldn't see them. I seen them a couple times, you know, when I would be out during the day, but I had uh, Queenie was with me, and they seen her, and they didn't want nothing to do with her, I don't think. So they they never came in at night when I was working there because they said, we, we can't have this, whatever you say. They could come in and wreck a generator or something for me, you know, if they wanted, but I never, never had to confront any of them, but I had to carry my rifle with me all the time for that two and a half years. Once I leave the leave the barracks, I had to have it with me. And I'd go out there and, and it was in my shed with me all the time. I kept it next to me, but I had stuff to do and I'd be running around and doing it out there. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't think nothing of it at the time. I just thought, it's, it's just part of the job. I wasn't worried about it, so. So they were still in the jungle when you left? It was better because they, flew over and dropped pamphlets a couple times a month, told them the war is over and uh, that they should come out. And I guess they finally figured they had them all, you know, so. So what did you <clears throat> eat? How did you get access to food when you were there? Oh, I could go to the chow hall anytime because my commander said, you feed him, he's got such unlimited hours, he don't know where he's at. He, if something breaks down, he has to work and keep keep it going. Cause if we got planes coming in and they have a breakdown, he has to be there real quick, like to get things going again. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd just go to the chow hall, and then sometimes they'd throw them in this square box, you know, and I'd have hot dish or toast and eggs or whatever, you know, that they had to feed me, whether it was two o'clock in the morning or. 10 and they were excellent in the chow hall. And that guy, he just really took care of me. He'd see me coming and if I'd come at regular hours for the chow hall, I, oh boy, I'm so glad to see you. He says, no, don't have to fix nothing for you today, no. I says, it, it's all right. And, and uh, So did you take extra back with you then? Huh? Did you take extra food back with you then? Sometimes, yeah. So how did you warm that up when you were there? It was always hot there. <laughs> I could lay it on my diesel engines and warm them up a little if I wanted to, but no, I, I just ate it the way it was and sit on the bench and it'd just jiggle on the bench and it, I, I ate it. I'm here today yet, so it must have been all right. Weather on Guam and the typhoons. Well, in the, in the wet season, it'd probably rain every one to two hours. And then the, when it would rain, then the sun would come out and then it would be real humid. And as soon as, <clears throat> maybe in another two hours, it might rain again. And in the dry season, it'd probably rain a couple times a day, you know. Mm -hmm. And the typhoons came, that's when I had to, I had the big six by six uh, 10 ton truck that I had to hook onto the radar site. So when the wind got over 96 miles an hour, then we had to move it in by the, the other hangers and that in the base. But I only had to move it once. And, and that's, that's tough to be out in wind. You try standing up and 60, 70 mile an hour winds, and you don't let go of anything until you got a hold of something good again. 
So, uh, and then I had two fatigues on, two raincoats, steel helmet, goggles, everything, because uh, you couldn't see nothing and the rain was just pouring down and blowing like crazy. And because uh, you had to have something for insulation when that rain hit you, just just like, I, well, I never had bullets hit me, but I mean, it was, it was you could feel it through, the, through all my clothes. And so, how many typhoons did you have when you were there? I went through seven or eight of them over there, but some of them were a little more vicious and some of them weren't real bad, but we all had to take precautions, you know, and so me and the radar site, we were us, people out there, there were four of us. We were kind of together off and on there mm -hmm. to make sure that they could stay on and know where the rest of the planes are flying for where the typhoon was. They could, they could watch some of the storm on the radar. So it was pretty interesting. So what was the average temp when you were there? And how, how cold did it get? Well, one night it got to 72 and it pretty froze to death, but otherwise normally it would get down to 80 at night and then back up to a few days it would be over 100. It, it varied back and forth, you know, so I mean, I, you know, it was really humid, you know, and it just, it just once you get used to living there, it, it wasn't too bad, but it, it just takes a while to get used to the humidity and the rain and everything coming. And so we got along with it. And then it's an adjustment to come back to Minnesota. Oh, yeah. So then when it was time for you to leave there, how did that go? It wasn't good. We had to leave in a typhoon was coming in that night. And so, boy, we got out in the ocean. You look through them portholes in the boat. And, man, the water would be 30 feet above you. Pretty soon you look out again and the water was 30 feet below you. And the boat was jumping around a little bit, but that didn't bother me none then, you know. But <clears throat> And after the, the first night, we got out of the storm, and then it was a little bumpy for a couple of days after that, not very bad. And then it kind of slowed down a little bit, and and uh, then I got sick, and I was thrown up and diarrhea and everything, and they, so they just padlocked me to the, with handcuffs to the railing, and my ankle, and I just laid there. They built a tent over me and come with crackers and water every hour. And I laid there for probably f 15 to 18 days. And uh, I said, just take them off and just push me overboard. I says, let me feed the sharks. But we made it and got home. And first thing we seen in 22 days coming home, I was looking out there and I was laying there and I was looking. At God, I could see something in the horizon. Uh, otherwise, all you seen was ocean. It kept coming and coming, and God, believe it or not, it was the Golden Gate Bridge. Man, that was a wonderful sight. Boy, and I says, I got to get up, and I got to put some clothes on, and put them on, and we sailed in about midnight or so under the Golden Gate Bridge, and then we just docked out there. The next morning at about 4.30, why they, the band came and they welcomed us and we got off the boat and, and, uh, <clears throat> and then we all got in a, in a bus and we, we wanted something to eat. So then we went to this one place and it was a restaurant there and, and uh, military paid for it. But I told the, the guy running the restaurant, I says, I, I just want a small piece of steak and I, I got to have a shot of whiskey. He says, I can't give you whiskey at this time. I says, okay. He says, you drink coffee? Yeah. So he came over to me and he set the cup down with my food. And he says, here's your coffee. 
and he had about that much whiskey in the bottom of the cup. And I drank that and ate my steak. And we took off again and got in the plane. And we were flying back, to, I think, uh, I think going to Kansas City. I can't remember for sure. And uh, we went up over the mountains and ran into a rainstorm. And the plane was just a small one, you know. It wasn't big. There was probably 25, 30 of us on there. And we jarring around and didn't bother me a bit. I didn't get sick. And the rest of them all had their heads in the sack, you know, and throwing up. And so we made it back home. So what was your rank when you were discharged and the date? Do you remember? Airman first class when I got discharged. I was up for staff, but I gave it to my good buddy down there. He had a wife and two kids, and he was in our shop. When I got discharged, away, I just told the board, I says, give it to Zerfus. He's going to take over here and just let him have it. So I was. I just wanted to get home. I was done. That was really my first leave that I had. Otherwise, I just had them seven days travel time when I brought my car home and went back and got on the plane. I was a half a day AWOL when I got out there. The train was a little late running. And time I got to f San Francisco and got to to uh, where where we picked the boats up right there in Frisco. And and then, uh, but nobody said nothing to me. We got on there, and the way we went, overseas. So when you came home, <laughs> did you drive from Kansas to home? No, I got I got a plane from down there, and flew into Rochester. And uh, I got off the plane. Up? Plane there, and Dad was up there to pick me up. It was 15 to 20 below zero that day. Whew. You know, when you're used to 80, 90 degrees, and all of a sudden, boom, boy, when I got off of there, I told Dad, You got to turn that heater up on high. He says, Son, it's up as high as it'll go. And I says, It ain't high enough. Dad had to stop and take his coat off. He was just roasting in there. <laughs> And uh, I sat right in front of the heater, soaking up all I could. <laughs> so then we got home, and it was wonderful, you know. So who was there to greet you? Mom and and uh, Alan and Karen and <clears throat> and uh, and Dad. Mm -hmm. and Dad, he coming all the way home, his tears are running down his face. <laughs> So he happy. missed me a whole lot, you know. He couldn't hardly talk. <laughs> so then, when you came home from Guam, then how did it go with Mom? Did you start dating her right away? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I... We started right away and so kind of gets me a little bit yet, you know, but, and then we got home in February <clears throat> and we got married in August. She waited that two and a half years for me. So then what did you do for a job after that? Well, then there was no, you couldn't get no unemployment. And uh, so I, Stan Lewis and 
my cousin was in the Cook Motor Company in Austin, and he says, you know, maybe I could get you in for two, three hours a day. <clears throat> so that then he did. He got me in and come in at at uh, six at night and empty the wastepaper baskets and sweep the floor and sweep the garage and hose it down and. And I'd get out of there probably 10, 11 o'clock at night. And that'd be the end of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, then finally I, I got in with Osmosons and, and uh, started there. I think I, I can't remember what it started at. I think it was 90 cents an hour there. And, and uh, it worked, you know. And you started running heavy equipment right away? Yeah. Drove so, trucks for the first six months or so, and then I got on the dozers after that. So the dozer, and what other kind of equipment did you use? Well, between the escalator and the backhoe and the blade, motor graders, and, and uh, I just kind of got used all of them a little bit, but most of the time I was always on the dozer, busy all the time with the dozer all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's where you stayed for most of your time then? Yeah. Between that and the excavator, and, and if they were short, I'd run the excavator some days for a little bit. and Not a lot, uh, mostly all dozer work. And, and once in a while I'd run the scraper for an hour or two and if they needed a little help, you know, and take the extra scraper there. And so that's the way it was. So when did you retire the first time? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I had 59 years in at Osmosons and I can't remember what day it was. My girls told me, Dad, it's time you retire. And so that's when I said, well, I guess I've got to start listening to my girls. And uh, I was 80 then, so I retired. I can't remember what year it was. And uh, since then, it's just go, go, go. Busy. I ain't really retired yet. And then where did you live? Well, first we lived in the old clinic. She worked in the clinic down below us there, you know, mm -hmm. downtown for Doc Snyder. And then uh, then this house beside Mom and Dad's up there where I grew up. So they moved out of there, so we moved in there. And, uh, and then... <clears throat> And we stayed there, and then we found this house here. And uh, because that one wasn't much. If you get out of bed in the, at night, uh, you had, we had to lay rugs out across the linoleum because your feet would freeze to the floor. It was so cold in there all the time. We put water in there for or milk for you girls. That would freeze up after about an hour and a half in there. So. But so we moved out, and then we got this palace here. Boy, it was nice, you know. And it's still good to this day. So. So that was in the early 1960s, 1961, uh, before I was born. Six, yeah, 60 when we were <coughs> here. Yeah, you was never in the other house. No. Tammy and Candy. Yeah, so you're three girls. Huh? You're three girls. Yeah, when I got here, then you then you were born here. Yeah. Do you remember coming home at night and mom would say, "Just go ahead and take them with you." <laughs> yeah. So where did you take us? <laughs> we just go outside the shed and do different things outside if if there was lawn work, you know. And I was teaching Tam how to run and, and how to run the mower, you know, and that and went that first time and I says, well, I'm going to watch you back here. And she took off with the mower, you know, and come back and she says, Dad, this thing ain't cutting good. Well, I, I says, I know that. 
well, what are you going to do? I says, you got to turn that switch on the dash there and so it, the mower starts going. <laughs> <laughs> so Candy run the mower some too, you know, and Mom run it some, and then you were born. And, <laughs> and then we used to go swimming and yeah, play uh, basketball and softball in the backyard. And uh, So tell us about your campers that you've had throughout your life. Uh, I've had a couple of motor homes and started with a tent one night, but that's when you girls were along. And mm -hmm. It rained and the tent leaked and it was a mess. We threw it in the trunk of the car and the water was still running out and we got home and <clears throat> and uh, then we invested in that one trailer and kept that for about 12, 15 years. The trailblazer. Yeah, trailblazer trailer. And, and uh, I'd get home on Saturdays and my three girls and mom would have that car all hooked up to the camper and the way we'd go and I'd take a nap when we'd get there sometimes because I was dog tired by then. And so we'd go for Saturday night and come home Sunday and go to work again, you know. So it, it was really nice. And then when we got the motor home, that was really something, you know. <clears throat> and now the last one was a diesel, and boy, we we love that. It's really nice, nice in there. So, how about your church? You want to talk about that a little bit? How long you've been there? Well, yeah, I was an usher in, at Little Cedar before I went over before I went in the service. <clears throat> and then when I came home, I then I they. They wanted to know if I'd be usher again, and so I've been an usher ever since when I come home. And and, uh, and then when Alfred Sassery passed away, why he was hit usher, why then they told me that I could want to know if I'd be hit usher. So I've been hit usher ever since. I think he died in, I don't know, it's probably 55, 60 years now. I don't know. I have to look see what the what it says in the church things for him. So you've been head usher for sixty years. Yeah, at least fifty five, fifty seven, someplace in there. Whatever year he passed away, well, then I took it over after that. And then I was on the church council for a while, mm -hmm. and uh, and then when we built this new church. Well, I was one of the six of us on the building committee for that. So it kept me busy. And you got to run your dozer over there. Yeah, yeah. And then we put the parking lot all in there and everything and stripped the black dirt off. And yeah, it, it worked just fine. I didn't have far to go to work for a couple of days while we was doing that. So. Tell us about the ambulance. Well, then I got involved in the ambulance. There was six or seven, I was think six, started the ambulance here. <clears throat> and uh, and so every night I'd probably be on the list. To, to, you had to stay right in the house. That's where the phone would ring, right in the house. We didn't have nothing, no other ways. And you'd get that, and then you'd get the call, and you'd go. And uh, and uh, got it started. And we just had a not much. It was just a a van at first, and then we got a a bigger van. And then we finally got a a bigger ambulance. And uh, it just kept coming up as we went on. And but uh, we just didn't have enough people at first, boy. It, all we had was an oxygen bottle and, and a first aid kit at first. So we had bare minimum, but we made it work. And to this day, we got a good ambulance system here. So it's wonderful. How many years did you do that? I was on for the first 20 years. And uh, I said, that's enough. Car accidents with little kids really bothered me, you know. 
They were, some of them weren't really what you'd call hurt, but they were just, the, they didn't know what was going on, you know. They were just so mixed up with, you know, being there. It was an experience for those 20 years. And I just said, I got enough. I got to got to get out of this. And uh, so. So your honor flight a few years ago. Yeah. Tammy, somebody, to, somebody had to go along with you to help you in case you needed something. And, and uh, <clears throat> So she went along with us, and boy, that flight was out of this world. You just can't explain it, you know. It just so nice. And uh, we got up there, and we was flying, and all of a sudden, it was really like a big fire underneath us. Golly, I thought we were on fire or something, you know. And it, it was probably about 7, 30, 8 o'clock. Here it was the sun, it was just coming up and we were way up there and it was shining underneath us, you know, it was really pretty. Yeah, because you left very early. <clears throat> yeah, it was very early, it was just, just barely peeking out and and uh, then we went and landed there in uh, D.C. and the welcoming committee, my God, they had people all over, they wanted to shake our hands and everything and, and uh, at the, towards the end of the line where they were singing <clears throat> the national anthem. And it uh, kind of brought tears to my eyes, you know. It was just such, just so beautiful, you know. And then there was about four or five gorgeous gals standing there. I suppose they were in their 20, 30 years old. And they'd give us a hug, you know, and, and it was really, really something, you know. And then they fed us a little breakfast, I think, there. And, and then we was on the plane. Before we got off the plane, we were flying, and they says the stewardess came through and says, "We are going to have mail call now." And I told Tammy, "They must be mixed up." I said, "There ain't no mail here." And Tam reached down in her bag, and she took out all the the letters that people had sent her for and, you. Yeah. did you see during that whole day? Well, the, the, the Korean uh, memorials and the Vietnam Memorial. memorials, <clears throat> and we yeah, couldn't go in. We just drove by and seen the Capitol. They wouldn't let us go in at that time. And uh, and we've seen the changing of the guard. And then the, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers. And uh, that was very interesting too, boy. Them, them guys, they were just walked just as straight as an arrow when they were marching, you know. And, and uh, and then the, the meals, we just kind of ate out in the open, but that night when we got ready to come back, 
two big bus loads of us. We went to this restaurant and they were all ready for us. I don't think we was in there over 20 minutes. And then we got back on the bus and went to the airplane and flew back to the cities again. It was a, how they had everything so organized to feed us like that quick, you know. It was a, it was a wonderful flight. I just, anybody that gets to go on that flight, if they don't enjoy it, I don't know what they're doing because it's unbelievable. That flight is just beyond words. You can't describe it, it's so wonderful. And all the people that were, you know, just saying hi and thank you for your service. Why, well, then my kids were there, you girls, Paul and Candy were there and, and all these other people and they were welcoming us home and golly it was 11.30 or so at night, you know, and I couldn't believe that many people would be in the airport and they were yelling at us and shaking our hands and everything. It was pretty darn nice, you know, so. Are you proud of your service? You bet, I'm glad I went. I owe it to this country, boy, and that's what I say. Uh, I maybe get criticism, but I think they should have kept the draft on. Everybody go for two years. They'd really appreciate the United States a whole lot better because uh, I, I know we got problems in the country, but boy, I'm telling you, we got a wonderful country here. quilt of valor that I got through on the military and, and uh, from the American Legion then from the American Legion and, and uh, another anyway it was made by my daughter Tamara L uh, Wilson and her name is here and uh, so I'm real proud of this it's beautiful quilt and so uh, Probably I'll take it along in the summertime if I need a quilt on the bed in the motor home. And it's, uh, it's really something for them to, to give us a quilt like this. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more vets now are, are getting it down here at the Legion too. I think they've gave out probably 10, 12 yeah. up and down here. So it's pretty nice. My three daughters are wonderful. And uh, my grandkids, jeepers, get together. They all got to come and give me a big hug, and that really melts me down, you know. And uh, they're so good to me, everybody. They love to go camping yeah. with you. Yeah, oh yeah, they all like to go camping. And, and the city of Adams has been a wonderful place to live, and everybody's pretty friendly here and treats me well. Mm -hmm. So I ain't got no complaints. They take good care of you. And uh, I play cards with those six widow ladies and they're, they're wonderful too, but they take good care of me. Every one of them. So what more could you ask for? I got a good life. I just thank everybody that's around by me and, and for the, everybody, my whole family, so it's wonderful.